Is there any board? Board I can well, if write you really want, we could take up the screen and use the uh, blackboard. There's some chalk. Okay. There's no whiteboard in here. Okay. Yeah. Okay, let's get started. Yeah, sorry, I was in the wrong floor. So yeah, we are a little bit late. So let's get started. Yeah, first I want to introduce myself. My name is Hui Lin Li. I'm the assistant professor in Division of Biostatistics, Department of Population Health. And uh, today I'm very happy to, to, talk, uh, to teach the following five lectures. Uh, about statistical analysis. So in, I, I believe in the past months, you have learned a lot from, from Dr. Brown and Dr. Fan Yu about the bioinformatics. So since you are interested in both bioinformatics and biostatistics, I'm wondering, can I ask you a question? What's the difference between bioinformatics and biostatistics? Yes. We also, as biostatistician, we also deal yeah, with the genetic obviously, data. Obviously, obviously, the biostatistician still needs the biostatistician mm -hmm. to be able to see the difference between the two. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I guess the biostatistics is broader in that sense than biostatistics. OK. Yeah. Let's hear what others says. Yes. Um, I think biostatistics deals with the value. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's in some sense of it. Yeah, actually, first of all, I think statistics is old. It could be dated back to 1920s when Pearson and Fisher first set up the foundation for, bio st for statistics. Well, bioinformatics is relatively new. It's just, uh, it just came up recently, and it evolves with the development of new, uh, new sequencing technology. And f to me, the difference between those two, put it in a simple way, is that bioinformatics is kind of application, application of computer science and informatic science to biology, while biostatistics is the application of statistics to biology. So obviously, computer science and, bio, uh, and the statistics are different fields. So bioinformatics and biostatistics are two different fields. But however, we put them put those two topics in one course, of course, those two are connected. They do share some common procedures, such like machine learning, and also, uh, most often, bioinformatic analysis usually end up with the bio biostatistical analysis. So that's why I'm here. I would like to introduce some statistical way to analyze the data in the following five lectures. Typically, for statistical work, it's usually started with the study design, and then we, then we collect the data. After the data are collected, we do some cleaning, and then we perform the data analysis. For this kind of data analysis, it's usually required the knowledge of probability and, uh, uh, and the statistical modeling. So you can see that probability is the foundation of the statistical analysis. So today, I'm going to fo focus on the probability. Well, actually, I skip one slide about the outline for, for, this, for today's lecture. I'm going to first introduce the definitions regarding the probability. Then I will introduce some operation rule for probability. In the end, I will introduce the Bayesian theorem. So probability is about the study of randomness. You can see things may happen randomly. For example, in the clinical trial, we apply a treatment to patients. The response from, the, from patients could be different. Some patients respond to the, to the treatment. Some do not. So the result could be random. And another example is the, what's the chance to develop breast cancer? Everyone got the chance to develop cancer, to develop breast cancer, but everyone has the different probability to develop breast cancer. Such like a male should 
should have smaller chance to develop breast cancer than female. For a certain female, if that female, their family has family history in breast cancer, then this female could have higher chance to develop breast cancer in the future. So everyone got a different, different chance to develop cancer, and this is another kind of randomness. So the probability is kind of study of randomness. We put a mathematical language to formalize this uncertainty. In order to stop study the randomness, we need to first introduce the random experiment. Random experiment is the process of observing the outcome of a chance event. Such like we, to we toss a coin. There are two possible outcomes, either head or tail. So to observe this kind of experiment, we got a we could have two possibilities. So a random experiment for which the outcome cannot be predicted with uncertainty, because for that example, we have two possible outcomes. Before doing that, we cannot predict which outcome is going to come up. But all possible outcomes must be, must, could be identified prior to the, to the performance. So before we toss in a coin, we know there are two possible outcomes. One is the head, one is the tail. And this experiment must be able to be repeated. This is the basic properties for the random experiment. And for any random experiment, we should be able to define the elementary outcomes. Elementary outcomes are all possible res results of the random experiment. For the tossing coin example, we know there are two possible outcomes, head and the tail. And all the, the set or collection of all the elementary outcomes, head or tail, consists of sample space for this experiment. Here's another example. We throw a single die. This is another random experiment. So what's the possible outcome for this, this experiment? Yeah, there are six possible outcomes. One, two, three, four, five, six. So all the set of all of those six outcomes consists of sample space. One, two, three, four, five, six. There are six elementary outcomes for this simple random example random exam, uh, experiment. Another example, if we throw a pair of dice instead of one single of die, what's the sample space for this experiment? For, right, yeah. For a single die, we have six possible outcomes. For a pair of die, we're going to have six by six, 26. 26 possible outcomes. So this is the total sample space for, uh, for the experiment with throwing a pair of dice. So next we want to introduce the probability theory. For a random experiment with n elementary outcomes, we denote them as O1 up to On, we could assign a numerical weight or probability to each outcome. And in practice, Actually, sometimes we can figure out the probability associated with each outcome, such like if we toss a fair coin. A fair coin means the head and the tail has equally possibility to show up. Then we know the probability of head shows up equals to the probability of tails shows up. They all equals 2.5, because there are only two equally likely, equal, equally likely happened events here, so each one each of them going to have the probability 0.5. For the other example, throw so one die, we know there are six equally likely happened outcomes. One, two, three, four, five, six. Then for each one of them, the probability for it happened is one over six. For throwing two dice, because we have 36 outcomes, for each of one, for each one of elementary outcomes show up, the probability of it is 1 over 36. So we define the probability of one elementary outcome is the likelihood of the occurrence of this event. Is that clear? 
So for each elementary outcome, we can define its probability. And there are certain properties for, those, for the probability. We usually use this omega to denote the whole sample space. The whole sample space is usually denoted by this omega. Then for each outcome, the probability of each outcome, it is, since it is a probability, it should be a number between 0 and 1. Any probability cannot be, non, cannot be negative. It should be non-negative. If one event, the probability is 0, that means this event is not, is gone, is not going to happen. If the probability of one event is 1, that means this event is, is going to happen in certain. And then if we know O1 up to ON are all the elementary outcomes for certain experiment, the summation of all of those elementary outcome should be equals to 1 because the probability of the whole sample space is equals to 1. This is the property of the probability. And also another definition is the null set we denote it as this sign, it's kind of, it's, we call it empty sign. That means there's no elements in this set. The probability of an empty sign, of empty set is zero. Nothing will happen, okay? So next I'm gonna talk about some basic operations for probabilities. First concept, the event. We have already talked about the elementary outcomes. Then an event is a set of elementary outcomes. The probability of an event is the sum of the probabilities of the elementary outcome in the set. Let's back to that, the two deaths problem. The first column shows you event A is the dice add up to three. So we first need to figure out which elementary outcomes consist of this, uh, this event. Throwing a pair of dice, we define one event is two dice add up to three. Can you tell me we, which elementary outcome does it include? Yes. The if the first one is one, the second one must be two to make the sum equals to three. This is a one, oh, sorry, it's a one, 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 two, yeah. And this is a one elementary outcome. Next one is two, one. The first one is two, the second one is one. Then the third one is, do we have the third one? No, there's only two possible elementary outcome for this event. And for each elementary outcome, we know the probability for it hap to happen is what? 36. One over 36. So there are two, this is the summation of two elementary outcome, then the probability for this event A is equals to two over 36. That is one over 18. Okay? So for event B, the deaths add up to six. What's the elementary outcomes for this event? The f if the first one is one, one, five, one, five, then two, uh, two, four, three, three, four, four, two, yeah. And uh, five, one, that's it, right? So how many, we, we count how many elementary outcome for E1 to be, one, two, three, four, five. Then five times one over 36. The probability for E1 to be is five over 36. Okay, is that clear? So for, we want to, if we want to figure out the probability for one E1, we need to list out all the elementary outcome for this E1 then we can figure out the probability for this event. So for the white die, if the white die shows one, the event C is white die shows one, how many possible elementary outcomes 
for this event. If we use the first number to denote the value of a white die. Right, yeah, white die is always one, then black die could be one, two, three, four, five, six. There are six possibility. So it's one, one, then up to one, six. So there are six possibilities. There are six elementary outcome. The probability for this event is six out of 36. The event D black die shows one. Actually, it's the same thing for event C. Just the, the second die is fixed to one, and the first die, the white die, could be from one to six. So it's still six out of 36. OK, so let's back to the. How to back to the slideshow, OK. OK, uh, yes. All right, so then hope here is the result for those four events. And then we move on to the next definition. Still, omega is, denote, is denoting the whole sample space. If one event A belongs to omega, that is one event A. So here in the picture, we just use a rectangular, this, this, this frame to denote the whole sample space. If A belongs to omega, then we draw a circle inside the frame to denote the event A. Then A bar, we call it the complement of A or not event A. They all denote the same thing. That is the set of all elements that do not belong to A, that is in the bracket, in the rectangular, anywhere other than the circle. That is A bar, the complement of event A. Here is some logic operations for the event. Here we have two events, A and B. The first, the first operation is A or B. We call it A union B. So mathematically, we write it A union B. The, that means you want A or you want B occurs, or both do. Either one is occur is OK. The second is A and B. Both of them should occur. So the event A and you want B both occur. We denote it as A intercept B. Mathematically, A intercept B. Then we have another operation is not A, the complement of A. The event A does not occur, we denote it as A bar. So here's some example. Suppose A denoted the set 1, 2, 3. B denoted the set 3, 4, 5. What's the intercept of A and B? 3. The overlap, the common one among those two sets. So A intercept B, we have Three, only one element. What's A union B? One, two, one, two, three, four, five. There are five elements. The next question, if let omega, the whole sample space, be the natural number, one, two, three, four, up to infinity, and uh, the positive integer, the natural number, and then let A to be the even number, the positive even number, two, four, six, eight. And then what's A complement? What's A bar? The complement of A. Anything in the sample space, but not in A. The, the sample space is all positive <coughs> integer, right? So A is all positive even number. So what's the complement of A is anything in the sample space but not in A. Gonna be the odd positive number. Okay, so A complement is one, three, five, da, da, da. Next example, if A is one, two, three, B is one, two, three, four, does A belongs to B? Yeah, if A, every element in A is also in B, that means A belongs to B. It is yes. 
Okay, so then we back to the slides. Here's another example. We back to the two dice example. We let C be the event white die is one. D is the event of black die is one. What's the probability of C? What's the probability of D? Then finally, we want to figure out what's the probability of C intercept D and the probability of C union D. So first, let's look at what's the probability of C. To find out the probability of C, we need to first list all the elementary outcome for C. For this experiment, we know there are totally 36 elementary outcome. It shows in this picture. Then what's the elementary outcomes for E1 to C? White die is one. Yes. Right, just the bottom row, right? Yeah, bottom row. All the white dies one, and then there are six of six of them. So here I use the picture. The the red bracket shows shows the U1, uh, elementary outcomes for E one C. There are six of them. So probability of C probability of C is one six out of thirty six is one one six. Similarly. For the event D, the black die is one. That's going to be everything in this blue bracket. Black die is one. There are six of, of them. So probability of D is also one six. Then what's the probability of P, the probability of C intercept of D? The event of C intercept of D, that means the overlap of those two events. By looking at the, those two brackets, you know only this one one is the overlap, the intercept of those two events. One out of 36 is the probability of C intercept of D. Is that okay? Then what's the probability of C union D? C union D, that means Either C happens or D happens. Anyone happens is okay, then that means the summation of the E1, the C, and the D, there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So there are 11 elementary, uh, elementary outcomes for C union D. So the probability of C union D is 11 out of 36. So G, this is the, we, we, we consider the sample space. And by counting the elementary outcome, we can figure out the probability of C union D. But from this example, I want to show you mathematically there's a formula. Yeah, here it shows up here. There's a formula to compute the probability of C union D. The probability of C union D equals to the probability of C plus probability of D. Then we need to minus the overlap of those two events. Because one way plus probability of C and the probability of D, the intercept part has been counted twice. So we need to minus this part. So PC is 1, 6 plus 1, 6 minus the intercept 1 over 36. It's going to be 11 out of 36. So for this is the addition rule. This is shows you the way how to calculate the probability of the union of two events. This is the probability, the summation of those two single probability minus the intercept, the probability of their intercept. So here is uh, another concept, mutually exclusive. If the overlap of event A and B is empty, we write it in this way, the probability of A intercept of B is zero, or the intercept of those two events is empty, then we call those two events are mutually, mutually <laughs> exclusive. Such like if event A is the dice add up to three, event D a dice add up to six. Those two events, you can see, is no overlap. That means the intercept is empty, the probability of the intercept is zero, so event A and B are mutually exclusive. Using this condition, 
we got a special addition rule. If A and B are mutually exclusive, then the probability of A union B is just a summation of those two, the probability of those two events. Because the third part minus the probability A intercept B is zero. Is that okay? Another rule, subtraction rule. If we know the probability of A, then the probability of A bar, that is the probability of not A, is just a one minus PA. This rule is useful because sometimes it's easier to calculate the probability of its complement. Such like, if I ask you, what's the probability of a double one is not shown? Yes, because the probability of a double one is shown is one out of 36. It's easily to figure out this probability. Then one minus it is just a probability of a double one not shown. Is that okay? So it's gonna be more difficult to, f to list all the possibility for a double one not shown. It's easier to first figure out what's the probability of a double one shown than with one minus it is just a probability for this event. Next, I would like to introduce the conditional probability. Conditional probability is a kind of little complicated, so I'm gonna go through an example to show the final definition of the conditional probability. Let's first look at the question, throw a pair of dice. What's the probability that the faces sum to three? So looking at the sample space, there are 36 elementary outcome. For the E1 to A, the summation of the two dice is three. There are two possible outcome. So probability of A is two out of 36. It's one eighteenth. Is it okay? So this is simple. Then the next question, suppose we throw the white die before the black die. The white die comes up one. We call this E1 to C. The E1 to C is the white die comes up one. The value of white die is one. Then what's the probability of A now? So given we observe the first white die is one, what's the probability the sum of those two dice is three? This is a kind of problem of conditional probabilities. We first, of, I introduced a notation. For the conditional probability, we use PA given three, use the bar to repre represent given. C is the condition. Conditional on C was the probability of A. Thinking about the sample space, whenever we talk about this conditional, conditional on C, the original sample space from 36 is reduced to six. This is the original sample space. There are 36 elementary outcomes. When we observe the first event, Y die is one, then the sample space is reduced to, reduced to only six elementary outcome. Is that okay? So next, if we want to calculate the probability of A given C, we just look at this reduced sample space. What's the event of A happened in this reduced sample space? The summation of two dice is three, so only one out of six represent the E1 to A happened given C happened first. So the probability of A given C is just equals to one out of six. So this is a one way to look at the conditional probability. Is this clear? So we need to think about the sample space. Given the condition C happened, the sample space is reduced then in this reduced sample space, we count how many elementary outcomes represented by E1 to A. Then we can figure out the probability of A given C. However, we want to continue to derive the formula for the conditional probability. So let's put all those events back to the original sample space. You can see E1 to C happened. 
E1 the C is represented by this blue bracket. Is that okay? That means the the black die. Uh, is that a, is a, the E1 the C is a, is black die or white die? A white die is a C. I'm sorry, I I I put the wrong basket here. Actually, this this blue die, this blue bracket should be the bottom of it. So let's just change the problem. If the E1C is just a black die, throw first, it shows up as one. Then what's the conditional probability of it? It's gonna be the same as the original problem. I just uh, made the graph by mistakes. Is that okay? So for E1C, if the E1C is just a black die, it's throw the first, and it shows up as one, then there are six possibilities, six possible elementary outcomes here. Then you want, and this you want, one plus two equals two three, is just an intercept of you want A and C. So by looking at, if we want to calculate the probability of A given C, we just are looking at, uh, the probability, the probability of A intercept of C, then divided the probability of C. Is that okay? So for any conditional probability, A given C, then it equals the probability of the intercept of those two events, divided the probability of the conditional event, C. So we figure out the probability of A intercept of C in the original sample space, and also for probability of C, then we can calculate this conditional probability. It's a one over 36 divided by one over six. We got the conditional probability for A given C is one six. Is this clear? So this way we derive the formula for the conditional probability. It's given by the P given F, is the here, right, because I prepared the slides using the windows and here when I transfer to the Apple, there's some, some, some weird figure here. It should be E intercept F. Mm, it's intercept. The, in the numerator is P intercept of F. And in the bottom is the probability of F. There are two facts associated with conditional probability probability of E given E is one. That means you want E is happen, then this E want is gonna be certain. Given E is happen, then the probability of E happen is one. And one E and F are mutually exclusive. That, mean, that means uh, giving you the information that E want F has happened doesn't give you any additional information on whether you want E will happen or not. There's a mutually exclusive. Given E is happened, doesn't help on the probability of E, so probability E given F is zero, if E and F are mutually exclusive. So actually, if we rearrange this conditional probability, yeah, it's a still, there's a notation problem here, it's a E intercept F, should be equals to the conditional probability of E given F multiply the probability of F. So because this E and Y is equally important, you can see we can flip the order of E and F, we get another multiplication rule. The probability of E given F also equals to the conditional probability of F given E multiply the probability of E. This is the multiplication rule. For the multiplication rule, if we introduce the idea of independence, we could simplify it. What's the independence between two events? We define the independence as if the probability of E equals to, equals to the conditional probability E given F, then E and F are independent. Or equally, if we know PF equals to PF given E, then E and F are independent. So using this independent rule, we can simplify the multiplication rule. 
that is, if E and F are independent, then probability of E intercept F is PE times PF. Is that okay? This is the multiplication rule. We're gonna use those rules to do more complicated calculations later. So there are sometimes we need to check whether those two events are independent or not. How to check two events are independent? We need to show that, we need to show if any of those equations stays true, then event E and F are independent. Either, either if you can show that the probability, the probability of E intercept F equals to probability of E multiplied probability of F, then E and F are independent. Here is the example. Say E1 C is white die comes up one, E1 D is black die comes up one. So can you show that E1 C and D are independent? Give you a hint, you can, you can to check the first equation in order to show that you want E and F, you uh, want C and D are independent. First, we can calculate the probability of C is what? One yeah, it's one of six because you want C is white die comes up to one. And you want D is black die comes up to one, the probability of D is also one, one six. Then what's the probability of C intercept D? Both C and D happened. That means we throw a white die and a black die. White die is one, black die is also one. What's the probability of this event? One, one out of 36. Then one six times one six equals to one out of 36. That means C, you want C and D are independent. Is that okay? Second one, you want F is the sum of two die is three. So you want C and F are not independent. Still, we can first calculate what's the probability of C intercept of F. What's the probability of both you want C and F happen? That means the sum of two dice is three and the white dice one. How many elementary outcome for this event? One, only white dice one, black dice two, one out of 36. Then you want to see is one out of six. Then probability of F, probability of F multiply probability of C is one out of 36 multiply one out of six. You can see, uh, I'm sorry here. Actually, I, I should use the board. Can, can we use the board to show here? Probability of F times probability of C. 
Is that okay? So if you are required, if you are asked to check the whether two events are independent or not, you need to back to this special equation. If the equation is satisfied, that means you want to see those two events are independent. So here's the summary. Some, it's a, we summarize all the rules we have been go through so far. The first one is the additional rule, addition rule. The probability of C union D is PC plus PD minus the probability of the intercept of those two events. A special addition rule is that whenever E and, sorry, here's whenever C and D are mutually exclusive, then the probability of C union D is just a summation of those two single probability. Subtraction rule, given the probability of event A, you can figure out the probability of Complement of A, yes. Could you explain more about the definition of independence? Like, does that mean um, <coughs> probability, probability of F to happen is completely independent of the probability of C to happen? Mm -hmm. So if you change the, the, the presumption, which has um, every single dice pair, has, they say they, they're not equally happen, equally to happen. Mm. So, f so, so in that case, Yeah, for that death problem, you can think about if those two deaths are not independent, you, there's a, a spring to connect them together. If we, then we throw them together, one, the value of one death gonna, gonna affect the value of the other one, then this is not independent. So, from so if we throw that uh, no connection, we just throw it independently, the value of one die doesn't affect the value of the other one, this is two independent event. So following your explanation, so Going back to exercise one, uh, where you see the C and D independent from each other. So mm -hmm. if you change the value of the probability C, doesn't affect. Yes. Yeah. No. Yes, doesn't affect the probability of D. They are totally independent. Knowing the information of on E one C doesn't help you knowing the the information on E one F. Okay. So here we we come to the case of positive. We're gonna use this example, finally leads to you the Bayesian theorem. And here's, a, here's the problem. Suppose a rare disease affects one out of every 1,000 people in a population. And suppose that there is a good but not perfect test for this disease. Here's the following information. If a person has the disease, the test comes back positive 99% of the time. We also know that about 2% of the uninfected patients also test positive. We want to figure out what's the probability if you are tested positive, what's the chance of you to, having the, to have the disease. So there are lots of information in the problem and we need to first the trans, yeah, 98. 98%. You need to be careful. So we first need to translate those information into mathematical language. <coughs> and this is not a simple one. Let's first define two events about in this problem. Let's see, event A be the patient has the disease. And you want B is the test is positive. Okay, let's back to the problem. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna use the chalkboard to solve this problem. Thank you. So you want Patients has 
Someone said that the answer is 98 percent. That is one minus one minus one minus probability B given A bar. That is the probability of P B bar given A bar. That is the probability of that. Uh, how 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 many percent of those unaffected patients got the negative test result? But we are want to find out. What's the probability if you are tested positive? If you are tested positive, that means if V happen, what's the probability of you don't have disease? It's a, the probability of given B happens, your chance of, of having the disease, that's A, right? So we want to figure out what's the probability of A given B? What's the probability of A given B? Using all the rules we have already learned, we can first write it, this conditional probability equals to the probability of A intercept of B divided by probability of B. Uh, yeah, probably I, I need to back to the slides. Thank you. <laughs> So in order to calculate the probability of A given B, using the conditional probability rule, we know it equals to the probability of A intercept of B divided by probability of B. We can further using some rule to write to the next step. The probability of A intercept of B using the multiplication rule, it equals to PB given A What's the number in the numerator? But the problem is in the denominator, what's the probability of B? What's the probability of the test is positive in the general population? In order to figure out the probability of B, I need to introduce the total probability rule. Let's look at this table. This table just uh, present a way we can divide the whole sample space for this problem into four mutually exclusive events. The sample space gonna be defined by those two events. Column represent event A, event A and not A. And the rows represent the event associated with B. 
the first row is B, the second row is not B. They are, they are mutually exclusive, right? So the whole sample space is divided into four parts. Then what's the probability of B? You can see the probability of B, the event B consists of two parts. That means event B equals to B intercept of A plus B intercept of A bar. Is that okay? So looking at this table, you can see the probability of B just uh, equals to the probability of those two events. Here should be B intercept of A, B intercept of A bar. And for each of them, we can use a multiplication rule to rewrite them into uh, using the condition we already know. PB intercept of A just to equals to PB given A multiplied by A. And the other one is PB intercept of PB given A bar multiplied by PA bar. This is the total probability rule. Is that okay? Using the conditional rule, we can come up the probability for PB. So this way, all of those four elements, we should be able to figure out from the problem, then we can calculate the probability of B. So by plugging in this formula into, back to that conditional formula, we have the probability of A given B equals to this. This is what we call it a Bayesian theorem. Is that okay for the Bayesian theorem? Next, we're gonna use this theorem to calculate the probability of the test, uh, the probability of the test is positive given that person is not, doesn't has disease. But the probability of A given B, what's our question? Given the patient test positive, what's the probability this patient has disease? Using the Bayesian rule, follow the formula, we just using the given information, we can calculate this probability equals to 0 0.0547, about 5%. That means what? Although this test is, sounds very accurate, if the person has the disease, it gives you 99% 90, 90, of the results are positive. But what that result shows that? If the person doesn't have the disease, if you apply the test on it, there's a 5% possibility, there are 5% the test results are also positive. This is called the false positive paradox. And why this happens? This is all because this is disease. This disease is really, really rare. You can see PA is equals to 0 0.110. One disease is really rare, although the, the test is really good, it sounds like good, its accuracy is 99%. It still have very unignorable chance that if you, if you doesn't have the disease, but the test is positive. Is that okay? So okay, this is a pretty this is a pretty much what I'm going I, I want to say in today's lectures. And here just one extra exercise. Still using the omega to represent the whole sample space. And for two events A1 and A2. Can you shade the area for A1 intercept A2 bar? Clinic and perform a test. 
the test is positive, everyone's gonna be very panicked, right? Oh, I'm gonna get, get cancer. But more likely, there are, if more likely there are five percent. I think it's a, there are five percent. Is the test is wrong? Ninety-five, right? Yeah, given. Uh, so B is a patient that has the positive. If given the test is the positive, the the probability of that. The, the so you have five percent. I mean, the test is does the test has five percent to be correct? Is that correct? No, right. I mean the if you if the patient uh, so. So the, basically, the question is talking we, about the accuracy of the test, right? So right. The, for the test, there are two parts: is the sensitivity and the specificity. So when you have the disease what's the probability this test going to give you the positive result? Yes. So for this one, it's 99%. And then when you, don't have the when you don't have the disease, when you don't have the disease, the probability the patient has a positive result is 2%. But we are calculating the probability if the patient tests a positive, you got a positive test result, what's the percent, what's the probability you real have the this disease is only five percent. So, so only five percent. Yeah, so let's say um, you have a thousand <coughs> patients with a positive tested mm -hmm. result. Mm -hmm. That means only five five um, patients among thousand patients actually have the disease, right? So if a general person just go to the clinic, you, you take the test, the test result is positive, actually only five percent for this person real have the disease. Only 5%. Uh, 50, 50, I'm sorry. So, yeah. you would say that's that's so that's very slight. So that means, yeah, if you go to the clinic, the doctor suggests you to take that test. So they suspect you have a cancer. You take the test, the test is positive. Then everyone's going to be panicked. Oh, I'm going to have a cancer. But actually, cancer, the, 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 the prevalence of cancer is really, really small. And then the probability for you, given you have a positive test result, to get a cancer is very, very small. So usually we need to go to another, go further to take another test or another procedure to, to screening out whether you have the cancer or not. So as Stuart mentioned, so you have to, uh, the, the test has 95% to, to be fair. It's false positive. Okay, got it. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah, just a before going to that exercise, is, um, is there any other questions about the stuff I have taught today? <coughs> if no, here, I think that exercise is going to help you on your homework. So given you want A1 and A2, how do, how do you figure out A1 intersect A2 bar in the graph? the omega, this is A1, and this is, if A and 2 are intersect A2, what's the area for A1 intersect A2 bar? That is, A1 is here, and A2, com complement of A2 is anywhere up here. This is A2 bar, right? And A1 intersect of this A2 bar is just this part. And mathematically, A1 intersect the A2 bar is A1 intersect omega minus A2. Then A1 intersect the omega is just uh, A1 minus A1 is that okay? A1 minus A1 intercept to A2 is A1 intercept the complement of A2. This is gonna be useful in your homework, so you better understand this part. Any questions? So in the next lecture, we're gonna introduce the distribution. And uh, the homework has already been uploaded to the website. It's going to be due next Sunday.
because it's already Thursday, and then we will, this homework gonna be due at the same time as the next week's homework. Is that okay? Yeah, if you have any questions, you can come to me, we can discuss. All right, yeah, that's it.